Hey, good day, everybody. Um, welcome and thank you for uh, tuning in to watch the Indian Boxer Ring interview. Uh, my name is Ishwar, and uh, my co-host today is Jessima, and our guest today uh, is Dr. Sri Devi. As you had all been anticipating this interview keenly, uh, Dr. Sri Devi is a wealth of information in the field, specializing in the field of canine uh, reproduction. Um, Dr. Sri Devi is a retired professor from the Tamil Nadu. Veterinary uh, Sciences and Animal uh, Veterinary and Animal Sciences University, Chennai, uh, Tanuas, in short, and her majoring field was animal reproduction, gynecology, and obstetrics, uh, specializing in canine reproduction. Um, being an academic academician and uh, also uh, being a veterinarian, uh, Dr. Sri Devi has conducted numerous seminars uh, for the veterinary community. Uh, and also has been um, a consulting veterinarian for the uh, Kennel Club of India as well. She has contributed in terms of numerous articles for the Kennel Club of India and has also uh, been part of uh, multiple projects uh, in veterinary science in topics like uh, nucleus breeding system through multiple ovulation and embryo transfer technology. Uh, well, it's uh, she's going to cover a wide array of topics, and we're excited to have Dr. Sri Devi with us today. Uh, Dr. Sri Devi, how are you doing? Fine, fine. Thank you. Thank you, Ishwar. Thank you for your nice introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm fine. I'm doing well. And I, and I mean, it's, it's a pleasure to be a part of your IBR. And, uh, and it's really a big pleasure for me to be, a, uh, to be doing this presentation uh, for everybody. So, yeah, I'm all set to go. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Now, I, I know boxers, uh, you know, we boxer people, as we so we call it, uh, we, are, we are very proud and passionate about our breed. Um, boxers are not an easy breed. Uh, you know, in terms of the probabilities that you have, you know, you might actually get a white pup, you might actually get, you know, puppies with defects. So breeding is extremely important. And, um, and of course, there's a lot of questions and challenges that come with breeding. And that's why we thought uh, it would be wonderful to have uh, somebody with the knowledge as yours to come in and uh, do this session with us. And thank you for accepting it again. Uh, for the benefit of viewers, the way the session is going to be structured is it's going to be structured in the form of a presentation that Dr. Sri Devi will be starting off with. Um, this is a lot of wealth of information. So if you don't have a pen and paper handy, I would strongly suggest that you make some notes. Uh, but again, um, this presentation is also going to be a permanent record. It's going to be available on YouTube should you wish to go back and refer this uh, information, uh, wealth of information that Dr. Sri Devi is going to share. Uh, also on the same front, if you have any questions about what topics that Dr. Sri Devi is covering, uh, please make a note of it because we're going to come back into this uh, format again for a QA and a session after the presentation. Uh, so with, without any further ado, Jay, Jay, do you have any thoughts to add? No, no we'll, as you said, we'll get started with the presentation. I think uh, the whole audience today would be uh, really excited to look into it and understand what Dr. has got to say. So we'll get started. Thank you, Ishwar, and thank you, Jay. So, Dr. Uh, yes. Uh, so, without any further ado, I actually hand the controls over to you uh, for you to actually take over the presentation. Uh, so, Jay and I uh, are not going to miss out on any detail, but we're not going to be a part of the screen. Uh, so, it's the control is all. Yeah. So, you can see the presentation, isn't it, uh, Ishwar? Uh, Hello. You can yes, see the presentation. Dr. Yes, I can. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Good evening, everybody. And it's a great pleasure once again to be a part of IBR and to be presenting this talk today. And uh, yeah, for a person who's been working in canine reproduction for the past, I think, probably 20, 25 years, I think the most common problem that I've faced in my practice is a potentially infertile pitch. So that's why I thought probably doing this presentation on canine breeding management, uh, I think uh, uh, that would help answer most of the questions uh, that's in your mind. So uh, for the next couple of minutes, I will be talking to you about uh, some of the sexual behavior and hormonal changes, which are very unique to canine reproductive practice. And I'll also be dealing with some of the sequence of events that are associated with ovulation. I will be talking about breeding methods, ovulation timing, and pregnancy management. 
So uh, just before we go on to the methods of breathing, different methods of breathing, now you need to know a little bit of basics of the canine Easter cycle because that's again going to apply on to your breathing management practices. So we all know that uh, the witch is very unique in that she has the longest Easter cycle when you compare to any other species. And each stage of the Easter cycle, so for example, if I say pro-estress, estress, di-estress, and each stage is very long when you compare to any other species. Now, since I'm going to talk about breeding, I'm going to only talk about the pro-estress and estress because I'm not going to talk about the rest of the stages. So we say pro-estress begins with the appearance of vaginal bleeding or spotting. So the very first day I see the vaginal bleeding, I see this dog has entered into pro-estress. Okay. Now, this duration on an average is nine days. But what I want you to remember at this point of time is that this duration is highly variable and can range anywhere between zero to two days to as long as 25 days. Okay, so now during this proestrus, the vulva is swollen and edematous. The discharge is bloody in nature and it's the vulva is hot to touch. That's why we use the colloquial term, the bitch is in heat. Okay. And this bitch is going to be very attractive to male dogs via signaling pheromones in the urine and vaginal secretions. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening or the sexual behavior during pro -estrus. I know, I know everybody knows about this, but this again is related to uh, how I am going to breed a dog based on sexual behavior. So when you talk about pro -estrus, I'm going to categorize this into early, mid and late. Okay. So now during early pro -estrus, this bitch, though she's going to be very attractive to male dogs, She'll be very aggressive to the male. She'll turn to bite or snarl at him, show her teeth when this male is going to mount her. Okay. Now remember, the male will start mounting the female right from day one of proestral bleeding. Okay. Now, but what the female does is that she's going to be showing a very aggressive behavior to the male. Now, as this dog is moving from proestress to estrus, now aggressiveness is going to get gradually replaced by what is called a submissiveness. So now during mid to late proestress, now the bitch. What she would do is when the male is mounting, the bitch may kind of sit down, hide a perineal region, or maybe she can lie down on her back. So, or some, some dogs may even tend to allow the male to mount during late proestress. Okay. So now, estrus begins with the first acceptance of the male and ends with the refusal of the male. In short, it's also the period of sexual receptivity. So clearly, please understand, it begins the day the bitch allows the male to mount and breed. That's called as the first day of estrum. And the day she refuses the male, then she that's the last day of the estrus. Okay. So now this duration on an average is nine days, but here too is highly variable. It can range anywhere between zero to two days to as long as 18 to 20 days. So giving this duration of proestrum and estrum, that means a bitch can come out of come and go out of heat within two days, or she could be continuously in heat for 45 days also. Okay. Now here. You need to know there are some unique events as far as hormones are concerned with dogs. Okay. Now, I, I, I'll try not to be too technical, but this is very important for you to remember because when I'm going to talk about breeding or when I'm going to talk about breeding based on progesterone assays, you need to know the background or the basis behind that. Now, for easy understanding, let me take a dog with nine days of proestrus and nine days of estrus. I call this bitch as an average bitch. So let's see what's happening in this average bitch. Okay. So when there is going to be a beginning of proestrus, you have a lot of follicles that are developing. What do you mean by follicles? Now, these are structures which are present in the ovary. And these follicles are responsible for production of the egg as well as production of the female hormones. So when you have a lot of follicles that are present there, the hormone that is going to be produced is going to be estrogen. So now this estrogen gradually increases. Around day seven, it peaks after it, it begins to decrease. Okay. And comes to basal elements. Don't worry. Don't, you don't have to really worry about the estrogen levels. Now, what's, what's very unique in the case of canines is around day seven, progesterone levels begin to increase. Now, this is very unique in that usually a progesterone happens only after an ovulation takes place. So what happens is you have the ovary, you have the follicles in it. Now, the follicle contains the egg. So when an ovulation takes place, now there is going to be a lot of blood. There's going to be infolding of all these tissues. And that structure that is subsequently formed is called as a corpus luteum. And this corpus luteum produces progesterone, which in turn maintains pregnancy. So in turn, in most or in almost all species, a progesterone is produced only after ovulation. But here in the case of canines, even before ovulation happens, there is an increase in progesterone. Now, this is very unique to the species. Okay. Now, where is the source of progesterone? First, 
So now these follicles, even before they ovulate, they're undergoing a process called as partial luteinization, and the luteal cells begin to secrete progesterone. So why should this happen in dogs? Why should it happen in dogs? Now, this decreasing estrogen and increasing progesterone is the triggering factor for standing estrus to happen, for LH surge to take place. So what exactly is this LH surge? Now this LH surge is a hormone that is responsible for ovulation. So this, this decreasing estrogen, increasing progesterone is a triggering factor for LH, for estrus, for LH surge and subsequently ovulation to take place. Now if there is going to be any aberration in this, then these events are not going to happen. Okay, so now the take home message from this particular slide is that if I know that there is an increase in progesterone level prior to ovulation, I can use this progesterone, estimation of progesterone levels to exactly predict when an LH surge is going to happen and when ovulation is going to take place. So this is going to be the basis behind breeding based on ovulation timing using progesterone assays. Okay, now this is again a very unique thing that's going to happen in the canine. So we're going to talk about ovulation. Okay, now again for easy understanding, I'm going to take a dog with nine days of proestrus and nine days of estrus. I want everybody to kind of focus on this because this slide is associated or your information on the slide is going to be associated on when to breed the dog, when to do a pregnancy diagnosis, when parturition takes place, what is related to low litter sizes, everything is related to what, what's happening or what I'm going to show right now. Okay, so as I told you, I'm going to talk about an average bitch and let's look at what are the sequence of events that are happening in an average bitch. Okay, so let's say this dog is entering her estrus on the ninth day. So you have an LH surge on the 10th day, okay? And usually ovulations happen 24 to 48 hours after the LH surge. Now in the case of canines, all the eggs don't come out at the same time. They happen over a span of four days. So for example, let's say 12, 13, 14, and 15, okay? Now I have four eggs on the 12th, th three eggs on the 13th, again, three on the 14th, two on the 15th. This is just, a, just an example, okay? Now these eggs, now, at the time of ovulation, what's so again peculiar in the case of canines is these eggs are not fit for fertilization. They are only primary oocytes. So it takes another two more days for them to become mature and fertile. So that means these 12 eggs, I mean, these four eggs which ovulated on the 12th, they are ready only on the 14th. And once they're ready on the 14th, that means we call them as secondary oocytes. Once they become secondary oocytes, they can survive only for 24 hours. So that means these four eggs will be available or alive after day 15 after which they will degenerate so that means these three eggs which ovulated on the 13th they are ready on the 15th they will be available up to day 16 then these three eggs are available or they're ready on the 16th they are going to be available up to day 17 and the last two eggs become ready on the 17th and they are going to be available up to day 18. so when you're talking about events okay estrus is a separate event LH surge is a separate event Ovulation is separate and fertilization is separate. So when I'm going to do a breeding management practice or when I'm going to do or, or when I'm going to adopt a breeding strategy or a breeding tool, management tool, it all depends on what event I am trying to identify. Am I identifying estrus? Am I identifying LH surge? Am I identifying ovulation? Or am I identifying fertilization? For example, let me say this. If I'm going to identify the LH surge, now I'll breed the dog four days later. Am I right? Because two days later is ovulation and two days later is fertilization. So when I identify the LH surge, I will breed the dog four days later. If I identify ovulation, I will breed the dog two days later. If I identify fertilization, I will breed the dog immediately. So that's why I told you that my breeding strategy is going to depend on what event I am trying to identify. Okay. Now there's another important event, uh, information that I need to pass on to you. Now this sperms, the male sperms, they're capable of surviving for a fee, in the female reproductive tract for a minimum of four to a maximum of nearly seven to 11 days in the female tract, okay? Now, having given you all this information, having given you all this information, now let's say I'm gonna breed this dog on 9th, 11th, and 13th. See, most of us, that's what we do. We all assume all dogs enter into estrus on the ninth day, and we breed them on 9th, 11th, and 13th. So I'm gonna breed this dog on 9th, 11th, and 13th. Now my question will be, will this dog conceive? Now this dog will definitely conceive because now those uh, the sperms which are going to be present on the 13th, 
they will be available for covering all these eggs. So 100% this dog is going to conceive. Now what happens if your dog is not an average bitch? If there's a deviation, if she deviates from the so-called average, okay? So let me give you an example, okay? So now this dog, let's say this dog is having a proestrus of 18 days. So that means she has a, she enters into estrus on the 19th. She has an LH surge on the 20th. She begins to ovulate on 22nd and fertilization starts on 24th, okay? So now I'm going to breed her on 9, 11, and 13. So now your question would be, how can you breed a dog in proestrus? Okay, now let's be frank. Most of us, what we do is we take the female to the male and we look for sexual receptivity, okay? So we assume. So when the female does not allow the male, what we do is we immediately tie the mouth of the female and we go in for post-breeding or post-mating, okay? So this is called as breeding based on predetermined dates. So what I'm going to do is I'm breeding her on 9, 11, and 13 when the dog is not yet ready, okay? So now what happens is when I'm doing a mating, now considering the sperm survival is going to take place between 4 to 11 days, now there are not going to be any sperms for fertilizing these eggs. So this dog is not going to conceive, okay? Another classical example I can give you. Let's say this dog is having a very short process so of one day. Now this dog is entering her estrus on the second. She has an LH surge on the third. Ovulation starts on the fifth. Fertilization starts on the seventh, okay? Now let's assume that I'm breeding her a little later, maybe on the 11th, 12th, or 13th, or 11th, or 13th, or 15th, or whatever it is. I'm breeding her when the dog is already entered into diestrus. This dog is also not going to conceive. So here again, you need to understand 90% of the so-called apparent infertility is only related to mismanagement or mistimed matings. Okay, now there's also something which is also related to too early or too late in matings, okay? I have a lot of times people asking me, doctor, last time she delivered around 10 puppies or eight puppies, but this time she delivered only one or two. Now, you need to understand that too early or too late a mating is also a major contributing factor for low litter size. Again, an example, let's say this dog is entering her estrus on the second, she uh, has an LH surge on the third, she begins ovulation on the fifth, and so fertilization starts on the seventh. So probably this dog I'm breeding her somewhere on nine and 10, and though there will be very little, there will be sperms to cover very little of these eggs that are going to be present at this time. So that means automatically you need to understand too early or too late a mating is also a major contributor for low litter sizes. Okay. Now, there's also something which is very, very important you need to understand, okay? So this again relates to the same slide which I was talking to you about. And here I want to talk to you about something called as the LH surge. So I already told you LH surge is the hormone that is responsible for ovulation. And ovulations happen 24 to 48 hours after the LH surge, okay? Now what's again very important in the case of canines is that every event in canine pregnancy is going to be centered only around the LH surge. When I say the gestation period is 63 to 65 days, it means 63 to 65 days from the day of LH surge, not from the date of mating. I want to clearly emphasize this because you have a lot of time people say, ma'am, I mated my dog. It's already 65 days. It's already 68 days. She's not yet delivered. So you need to understand this calculation of pregnancy or the gestational age is related to 63 to 65 days from the day of LH surge, not from the date of your mating. Now, because there is an extreme variation in proestrum and estrum, and because the, the bitch is going to be receptive over a longer period of time, and owing to the sperm or the longer duration of sperm viability, well things can happen as early as 57 days to even as late as 72 days from the date of mating. But it will always be 63, 64, 65 days from the day of LH surge. This is a rule. This is a rule that always happens, okay? So this is again something to explain to you, okay? Now this is again related to when I should take my dog for a pregnancy diagnosis, why there could be certain failures with pregnancy diagnosis. So all this is related to understanding of what's happening here, okay? So once again, an example, this dog is entering her estrus on the 17th. She has an LH surge on the 18th. Now she, she begins to ovulate from 20 to 23rd and fertilization is happening from 22 to 26, okay? Now, there is a possibility for a conception to take place, definitely, because as I told you, giving the sperm viability, there is a possibility of conception to take place. Okay. Now, you are going to calculate the gestation period from here, either 9th or from 13th. Definitely, this dog would have conceived, right? 
because of sperm viability and the presence of eggs that are conceived. But you will be calculating the pregnancy or the time of parturition from here or from here. But where are you supposed to actually calculate? You're supposed to calculate from here. So when you calculate from here, this dog will exactly deliver by 63, 64, 65 days. But when you calculate it from 9th or 13th, this dog will end up delivering somewhere around 70 to 72 days from the date of mating. So you need to clearly understand this aspect. Okay. Now, there's also something called as, sometimes you may have taken your dog for a radiographic examination to your vet. Okay. And we normally say by 45 days, you can see the fetal skeletons in an x-ray. Okay. Now, what happens is, so you're going to calculate this 45 days from 9th day or 13th day. And you take your dog to your veterinarian for an uh, for a radiographic examination. So you have a radiograph done and you don't then once the radiograph comes out, you will not be able to see any fetal skeleton. So now you assume that your dog is non pregnant. But finally, you find that this dog goes and delivers puppies at a later date. Now here again, you need to understand when I say I can see the fetal skeletons in an x ray at 45 days, it means 45 days from the day of LS surge, not from the date of your mating at all. So your next question, I know your next question, you'll be anxiously, you'll be saying, now, so how do I calculate the LH surge? Don't worry about all this. You don't have to be really worried about an LH surge, but you need to understand that when I'm going to do a too early diagnosis of pregnancy, I may not be able to diagnose a pregnancy. So here, your thumb rule, or you need to understand that all negatives in an ultrasound or an radiography needs to be repeated. So you need to definitely go for a second evaluation to check for a pregnancy or to confirm a pregnancy okay so now we go on to breeding management practices okay so as i told you 90 percent of this so-called apparent infertility i use the word apparent it's not a real infertility it's an apparent infertility is related only to mistimed matings or mismanagement only 10 percent are really attributed to lack of fertilization or embryonic or fetal resorption and that's why my focus on today's presentation is only going to be on breeding management Okay, so let's go on to some of the errors in breeding management. Okay, so what we commonly practice and what we are not supposed to do, I, rather I would say the don'ts in breeding management. Okay, so the first one is the use of predetermined dates. I think we've already seen this enough. So most of us have a tendency to breed the dogs on 9, 11, and 13. Okay, so this is called as breeding based on predetermined dates. Now, this is going to work for an average bitch, but it does not work for all bitches that deviate from the so called average. Okay, now the second thing is I've had a lot of time. People, uh, you know, male dog owners saying, my dog, I can give only two matings for my stud dog, okay? Now, they tend to restrict the number of matings or probably they will have two, three females that are going to be mated at the same time and they probably restrict the number of matings for a particular male, okay? For a particular female. Now, giving this variation in the duration of pro stress and the duration of e stress, because of this, the ovulation time is also highly variable. It can happen as early as day five. It can happen as early as day 21 because of so much of variation. Now, come on, tell me which two dates will I ideally fix for mating? Now, this is very difficult. You need to clearly understand that it's just offhandedly. I cannot give two matings. Uh, I mean, two dates for a mating without actually identifying what's happening in this particular dog. OK, so that means multiple matings throughout the period of stress is going to be ideal. It's perfect. If I'm going to restrict the number of matings, then I have to definitely go for ovulation timing. Okay, so that's again one of the errors. Maximizing the number of matings to a female dog will help in increasing the chances of conception. Okay, now another mistake we commonly do is breeding based on the color of the vaginal discharge. Okay, so normally the discharge is bloody in nature. As the dog moves from proestrus to estrus, the discharge slowly changes into a straw colored sanguinous discharge. Okay, now you need to understand that some dogs. The color of the discharge never changes. It goes, it remains bloody throughout proestrus, estrus, and even into diestrus also. Okay. So what you'll be waiting for the change for the color to change, but by the time the dog is already out of heat. So never use the color of the discharge to or, or to determine the breeding dates. Okay. And also using the behavior of the male. So now this is again, I need to understand, you need to clearly understand that males will be ready to mount the female right from day one of proestral breeding. So never use the male. To choose the breeding dates it's actually the sexual receptivity of the female that we need to actually look for while determining the date for mating okay and also the last major mistake that we commonly all make or error in breeding management we always assume that the male is fertile okay now for a person who is working uh, in canine reproduction i've seen a lot of infertility cases with male 
And most times when there's going to be an infertility management, it's easier to evaluate a male first and rule out its role in infertility and then go for the evaluation of the female. So it's always good to have a, 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 a kind of a semen evaluation done once in every six months to make sure that your dog is fertile. And uh, yeah, so now after your errors, now we are going to look at some of the routine pre-breeding management. So what should I do before breeding my dog? Okay. Now there are two aspects that I would like to cover. One is called as brucellosis testing. The other one is called as other one is vaginal cultures. Okay. Now what exactly is this brucellosis? Now I tend to address this. I've been addressing this for years together, but somehow this is not kind of you know taking um, uh, a kind of people are not giving so much of importance to it. Uh, but probably because uh, the incidence is not yet kind of documented for the lack of uh, proper isolation of this organism. This is a very, very, you know, delicate organism which cannot be normally isolated. So we do not have diagnostic uh, techniques that really identify this condition. But even then, now you need to understand that this is a bacterial infection and which when if your dog is going to be infected with brucellosis, it results in abortion between 45 to 59 days of gestation. It results in the birth of ill or stillborn puppies, fetal resorption and infertility in the case of females. Now, in the case of males, almost all the organs are affected and it causes inflammation of the testis. We call that as orchitis, inflammation of the epidermis, inflammation of the prostate gland and subsequent leads to testicular atrophy, infertility. So how does this bacteria or how does this brucellosis spread? Now you tell me every root, spread is through every root, the seminal fluid, vaginal secretions, discharges from an aborting bitch, aborted fetuses, body fluids, urine, airborne. So sometimes a female dog, she may have aborted the first time. Subsequently, she may be carrying a litter, normal litter. And then probably what happens is the puppies which are born, now they are going to be lifetime carriers. So you need to understand that the source of spread is almost through every root. Okay, incidence. As I told you, the incidence is tough. It's not been pre properly established. But for a short period of time, when I did a diagnosis, we had some, uh, you know, we had some kits that were imported from abroad. And for a very short period of time, during the month of May, I think probably in the year 2016, so there was a, little, a, 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 a research, ongoing research on brucellosis and complete. And at one particular point of time, there were so many abortions and almost 15 cases of that turned to be positive. Now you need to understand, see, as far as brucellosis is concerned, it's not the numbers that matter, okay? Getting even one infected dog into a breeding program is going to wipe out years of hard work, okay? So basically there is no cure for this. There are no vaccines that are available. There's no treatment. The only way to prevent this condition is to check for, or to check for brucellosis and every time a start is mated to a female dog or every time a female is taken to a male, okay? So it's important that both the female, both the partners or the either female dog owners or the male doggers insist on a negative brucellosis test, testing, okay? So dogs positive for brucellosis should never be bred either naturally or artificially because getting one infected dog into a breeding program is going to wipe out years of hard work, okay? So now we're going on to vaginal cultures, okay? Now, I've had a lot of times uh, uh, female dog owners approaching me saying that the male dog owner has requested for a negative vaginal culture. Now, frankly speaking, what exactly are you looking for in vaginal cultures? Okay. Now, every time I'm going to take a swap from a female or from the vagina of the female or from the pupils of the male, I'm always going to contain and there is always going to be a growth of organisms that is going to be present. Okay. Because there are always common cell organisms that are present the vagina of the female as well as the pupils of the male. So trying to get vaginal cultures without any clinical science or a history of reproductive dysfunction is not exactly warranted, okay? So if you're thinking that you're going to rule out organisms or the rule out the presence of organisms that are going to cause infertility, abortion, stillbirths, or neonatal deaths, none of these organisms that are causing all this cannot be isolated from your routine culturing practices or, or routine culturing procedures, okay? So that means they're not basically warranted. So having spoken about pre-breeding management, let me talk about the common methods of breeding, okay? So we're gonna do breeding based on four important methods. One is breeding based on sexual behavior, breeding based on vaginal exfoliative cytology, vaginoscopy and hormone assays, okay? Now when it comes to any of these techniques, your goal in breeding management is to have sperms continuously in the reproductive tract 
when our ovulation is going to take place. Okay. So always remember this is going to be your goal. So whatever it being is going to be my a breeding practice that I'm going to adopt. Okay. So when I'm going to do a breeding based on sexual behavior. So what we do here is starting from day five of proestrogen breeding, I'm going to take the bitch to the male. We always take the bitch to the male rather than, uh, instead of bringing the male, okay, to the bitch. Now this, I'm going to look for sexual receptivity in the female. Now if the bitch does not allow the male, I'm going to bring her back. Again, I'm every once in two days, I'm going to repeat this. I do it on the fifth day, then again, six, seven, I do it again on the eighth day. I keep repeating this once in every two days. The very first day the bitch allows the male to mount and breed. I know this bitch has entered into estrus. So what is going to be my breeding strategy here? Now you need to understand that I have what event? I'm only identifying estrus here. Okay. I'm not identifying ovulation. I don't know what will be the duration of estrus in this particular dog. I don't know when she's going to ovulate. So my breeding strategy would be this way. I would start breeding her and go on breeding her once in every four days until refusal. Why every four days? Why not alternate days? I'm doing it every four days. So that means I'm breeding her today, give a gap of three days, breed her again on the fourth day, give a gap of three days, breed her again on the fourth day. Why every four days? Now this is because the sperms are alive for a minimum of four days to a maximum of nearly seven to 11 days in the track. So remember my goal? My goal is to have sperms continuously in the track whenever ovulation is going to take place. 100% this dog will conceive, okay? So the advantage of this technique is that it's inexpensive, no special tools required. The disadvantage would be that some dominant females will never allow male, submissive males to mount and breed. So you'll be waiting for sexual receptivity. But actually this dog will be in very much in heat, but she will receive, refuse all mating attempts by the male, okay? Some females may have male preferences. She may not be wanting to mate, I mean, breed with a dog that you're actually intending to breed. Probably she'd be interested in some street dog near the gate, okay? So this normally happens. I've had a lot of time people coming to me with this problem. So in such situations too, you may miss the heat, miss the sexual receptivity of the female. And also, you may always find this going every time, taking the female to the male, bringing her back. This could be, you, you may find it a little bit cumbersome, okay? So now, you all you need to, oh, I'm, I'm talking about, you don't have to go always to the male dog owner, then bring her back again, go back to the male dog owner, bring her back again. So all you can do is, any male which is located nearby, your neighboring house, any male that is, I could have a great name female, I could have a chihuahua male, it doesn't matter to me. All I'm looking for is whether the female is standing for a male, okay? And this is going to be the most important aspect as far as breeding based on sexual receptivity is concerned. So when it comes to vaginal cytology, what we do is here is we, as a veterinarian, I'm going to take vaginal smears and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to stain these smears and I'm going to examine them under the microscope, okay? And we normally what we do is when I'm going to examine them in a microscope, I, look, I see different kinds of these cell types here, okay? Now I count 100 cells and I look for which of these cells are predominant, okay? And the type of cells that are predominant is going to determine what stage the dog is, whether she's in pro estrus, early estrus, late estrus, or whether she's already out of heat. So this is an excellent tool for every practicing veterinarian, okay? So it helps you to tell what stage of the cycle this bitch is, okay? So here what we do is starting from day five, don't bother of the cell types and all that, starting from day five. And like, let's take an example of this case. On day five, the dog is in pro estrus. Day eight, again, I'm taking a smear two days later. I find she's in mid estrus. Two days later, again, I take a smear. She's in late pro estrus. Now on day 14, I now identify this bitch has entered into estrus. So now what is my breeding strategy here? So once again, here, my event that I'm identifying is only, I've identified estrus, okay? So I still do not know what is the duration of estrus. I still do not know what will be the time of ovulation. So here do what I do is I keep breeding the dog once in every four days until refusal. Okay, now that's very, very important. Okay, so just four days is not important. I need to breed the dog once in every four days until refusal because you're identifying estrus, onset of estrus, you have an end of estrus. So that means ovulation should happen only during the span. So here too, you're going to satisfy the goal of having sperms continuously in the tract whenever ovulation is taking place. 100% this dog is going to conceive. Okay, so that means when I'm going to do breeding based on sexual behavior or breeding based on cytology, multiple breedings throughout the period of standing each term is a must. Okay, there's no compromise on that. Okay, so what if I want to restrict the number of matings? I don't want to go for so many matings. 
let's say i have a mail which is located in bombay i need to, i'm located in chennai i need to go go to bombay to meeting so i can't stay there for 20 days keep meeting or every four days until it is it's not possible so there i would my choice would be to go for ovulation timing so ovulation timing this is an aid to modern breeding management and where here my goal is slightly narrowed down i my goal is to identify the lh surge identify the time of ovulation or identify the time of fertilization so it's a very narrow window a critical or a very important event that i am a specific event that i am trying to identify okay so there are two methods here which i am going to do breeding based on vaginoscopy and breeding based on hormone assays okay now in vaginoscopy what we do is we have a scope which we introduce into the vagina and we look for changes in the mucosal folds and contours so during proestrus the vaginal mucosa is highly edematous and as the dog is moving from proestrus to estrus there's going to be shrinkage of mucosa and the mucosa is thrown into folds so now this period what you're seeing here i call this a shrinkage with angulation now this period corresponds to fertilization period so if i'm going to identify this a single mating during this period is excellent because it gives you excellent uh, uh, you know results because i'm breeding the dog exactly during the fertilization period now this is also ideal because if i'm going to have a dog with a very low sperm count i still want to have progeny out of him ideally breeding based on either vaginoscopy or hormone assays is going to be your excellent okay now here the only disadvantage is that this technique is subjective okay it needs a veterinarian to handle it and you need an equipment okay it's a costly equipment that is involved as far as this technique is concerned okay so now breeding based on progesterone next is hormone assays so i already told you that dogs are unique in that there is a pre ovulatory rise in progesterone levels that means progesterone begins to increase prior to ovulation this is very unique in the case of canines okay so that means if i'm going to estimate the progesterone levels i can exactly predict when the dog is going to ovulate okay now the other hormone that is responsible for ovulation is lh so that means primarily the main hormone responsible for ovulation is lh so if i identify lh i know when she is going to ovulate but the problem with lh estimation is that it is it's kind of you know the kits are not you know easily available and whatever available they are they are kind of they have a very poor shelf life okay and daily sampling is a must for identification of lh right and laboratory also if i'm going to try to estimate lh in a laboratory it is not possible because i need specific canine lh antigen to estimate the lh levels in dogs okay so that means estimating lh to predict ovulation is ruled out instead clinically it is possible to estimate the progesterone levels so on the right side you have two kits here so okay you have lots of kits that are associated with ovulation timing so the com two commonly used kits were uh, this ovicheck premade target which i've i've worked with extensively and these kits are semi quantitative assays that means for a particular hormone level there will be a particular color that is going to be produced okay so based on this color development we could say okay now this dog is still in proestrus this dog is ovulating this is fertilization so we could go for this so the turnaround time is just 30 minutes so within 30 minutes you get the results and again it's an excellent test okay now these are currently not available in india they are available abroad but they're not available in india but instead what you could do is you could simply collect the blood samples give it to the laboratories and since progesterone is estimations are not species specific okay the same test that i can use for humans can be tested for can be used for dogs too okay so i am going to check for the progesterone levels and based on the level of progesterone i am going to tell when the dog is going to ovulate okay so what we do here is starting from day 5 we keep collecting the progesterone levels okay so the fifth day seventh day ninth day now here you need to understand as far as ovulation timing is concerned all testings are done on alternate days because you are trying to identify a very unique event right so it needs to be done on a daily basis or on an alternate day basis okay so i keep collecting the samples the day the levels reach around 4 nanograms i know that ovulation is started okay so that means what i'm going to do is i'm not going to breed the dog now i breed the dog 2 days later and i'm going to rebreed her 48 hours later okay so this is going to be there so i would here too i would get a 100% consumption okay so the advantages of this ovulation timing is that this, it reduces the number of matings that is going to take place so here this is a picture which i i never fail to kind of you know introduce in almost all my presentations so this is a a, a kind of a background with almost i think 
this dog delivered 19 neopolitan puppies i think a couple of puppies were lost and uh, so this the, the whole idea to put this is there was an ovulation timing done this dog was mated based on ovulation timing and i want to emphasize that the litter size is not because you did an ovulation timing or you have more amount of eggs because there is an ovulation timing done no it's not that the whole idea is that you're covering almost all the ovulated eggs that are there okay so what happens is that automatically the litter size is going to be very high so if it is going to be breeding based on the first two techniques like sexual behavior or vaginal cytology multiple matings are also going to ensure uh, maximum consumption rate as well as very good litter sizes okay so now having talked about uh, the breeding management your take home message should be that no single test will pinpoint an appropriate breeding time so we always use a combination of tools i use either sexual behavior or cytology i use cytology plus progesterone assays i use a combination of tools to actually do a breeding management uh, what do you call that a practice okay so now once i breed a dog so what should i do so the next question people you ask automatically you would ask this should i start with supplements should i start with in should i start increasing a diet immediately after breeding can i vaccinate or deworm my dog okay now i would simply say don't do anything after the first 30 days now at 30 days go for a pregnancy diagnosis confirm whether your dog is pregnant and then try to address all these issues okay so now this calls for an early pregnancy diagnosis okay now traditional methods of pregnancy diagnosis involve abdominal palpation so where we do a palpation between 24 to 32 days of gestation so remember only between 24 to 32 days i would be able to see ping pong ball like uterine swellings okay and this is from the day of lh search now beyond 32 days what happens is these swellings become much more elongated softer and pliable so any amount of palpation i will not be able to diagnose a pregnancy at all so that means i need to depend upon other methods for pregnancy diagnosis such as ultrasonography hormone assays and radiography okay so the most important method i would think about is only ultrasonography because hormone assays are based on relaxin estimations and currently relaxin assays are not available in india radiographic assays for early pregnancy diagnosis is not possible so ultrasonography is your only method for pregnancy diagnosis at this stage so what i do here is i'm going to confirm a pregnancy and i'm also going to use this ultrasound to monitor the fetal development to check whether the fetus is viable so i'm looking for fetal viability and i'm also going to estimate the age of the fetus and based on this age of the fetus i'm going to predict the time of parturition i'm going to tell you when the dog is going to deliver it's called as expected date of delivery or days before parturition okay so best time to perform an ultrasonography is between around 25 to 30 days post mating because as i said i do not know when the lh search can happen so basically giving an allowance for all this i would do a pregnancy i would go to my vet for a pregnancy diagnosis at 30 days if the vet is not able to visualize anything then he may ask you to come for a repeat ultrasound go for a repeat ultrasound after 10 days and so this is this is how it's basically done okay so when i'm doing an ultrasound okay you are saying something we call this as in an early pregnancy of less than 40 days not early pregnancy in a pregnancy of less than 40 days i see what is called as gestational facts you are able to see now this in this uh, screen or in this uh, particular view i'm able to see one two three four four gestational facts okay there could be more but in this particular view i'm able to see four gestational facts and you see you see me measuring uh, doing what is called a caliper measurement so based on this we have a formula and based on the formula we have we calculate the days before parturition which is 65 minus the gestational age will give you expected date of delivery now when it is going to be more than 40 days i'm going to do a head diameter measurement and again we have a formula which calculates the age of the fetus and days before parturition is 65 minus gestational age okay now this is fine now ideally it's very important that you go for these or the the accuracy of predictions are higher when you go for an early pregnancy diagnosis okay now as you just advance in gestation i have a lot of times people coming to me at 55 days they have not never done a pregnancy diagnosis they come to me for 55 days they want to check the viability of the fetus make sure everything is fine and they would ask me when my dog is going to deliver okay now you need to understand ultrasound examinations done towards the later stage of gestation will be highly erroneous okay now this is the last three weeks of gestation is there when there's going to be a rapid growth of the fetus okay 
And all my measurements are based on head diameter. So there could be one fetus which is big, one fetus which is being to be small. So this, based on this, my prediction would be a total error. So always it's very important for you to go for an early pregnancy diagnosis rather than going at 55 days and asking for a time of parturition. Okay. Now, once a pregnancy is done, the next question you automatically would ask is knowing for fetal numbers. Okay. Now, let's be, let's be very frank. Ultrasound is not a good technique to talk about fetal numbers because if I'm going to keep my probe here, I would be seeing two fetuses here. If I keep my probe here, I'd say maybe I'm seeing the same two fetuses. But I would say it as four. Okay. So overestimation or underestimation of fetal numbers is a common mistake I would make with, with, with ultrasonography. Okay. So here, the most important thing with ultrasound is early diagnosis, checking for fetal viability, and monitoring the growth of the fetus. Okay. So that's the basic advantages of an ultrasound. Okay. Now, once that your dog is diagnosed positive for pregnancy, now I'm going to talk about pregnancy management. Okay. I'm going to talk about a little bit about nutrition. Now, this is an area that is prone to mismanagement. Now, the first four weeks of gestation, up to the first four weeks, I said, don't do nothing. You don't have to be bothered. You don't have to change the diet of the dog. It is on a normal, put the dog on a normal maintenance diet. Okay. Now, after it's after this four weeks is a time when you need to change the nutrition, the nutrition, and you need to supply or give a nutrition, a complete nutrition for growth, pregnancy, and lactation. Okay. And this diet should have should be containing around 29 to 32 percent of protein, around 18 percent of fat, 20 to 30 percent of carbohydrate. Now this is very very important. Now research, the sufficient research or extensive research that has shown that a carbohydrate deficiency during pregnancy may lead to death of puppies or neonatal increase, neonatal death, death immediately after birth. Okay, so that means a good nutrition. Is very important during pregnancy. Okay. Now, overnutrition can also be detrimental as nutritional deficiency. So, that means you need to avoid an excess feeding. Okay. Overloading dogs with mineral and vitamin, vitamin supplements are also highly detrimental rather than beneficial. So, do not overload your dogs. Now, excess of vitamin A, D are, are all, all are reasons why or they could contribute to the development of a cleft palate. Excess vitamin C may interfere with normal process of bone development. B-complex vitamins are beneficial, but you need to avoid vitamin D and calcium supplementation. Okay, now coming on to calcium supplementation. I've seen in my practice, a lot of times breeders tell, ma'am, I give calcium, so much of calcium in the morning, so much of calcium in the evening. I do understand that there is a threefold increase in calcium requirement during late gestation and lactation. And if your diet is deficient in this calcium, it may lead to eclampsia, or condition called as eclampsia, which could be highly serious or fatal to the dam. Okay. Now, if I'm going to supplement an excess calcium also, that may also predispose the dog to go in for hypocalcemia or eclampsia. Or it may cause gastric dilatation of volvulus in puppies and it interferes with absorption and zinc and manganese. So that means if I'm going to give a deficiency of calcium, also it may lead to eclampsia. Excess calcium also it may lead to, uh, to calcium, uh, I mean, eclampsia. So how much of calcium to give? Okay. Now this is a big question. This is this is this is kind of difficult to answer because when I'm talking about a homemade diet, when you're giving a homemade diet, you do not know how much of calcium that's going inside the dog. Okay. So that's why I would, as a veterinarian, I would prefer to go for a commercial. I would I would prefer a, you know to go for a commercial diet that is suited for pregnancy and lactation because at this point I'm sure about the amount of calcium that's going into the dog okay i know that commercial dog foods contain calcium and phosphorus in the ratio 1.2 is to 1 and that is sufficient to meet the threefold increase in calcium requirement in late gestation on, uh, and lactation please remember dietary supplements are needed only when the diet fails to supply the optimum level of nutrients okay so points to consider while feeding a pregnant dog now this is kind of a summing up on nutrition you need to feed a dog. I mean, you need to feed a diet which is easily digestible and which is a good source of good, pro good quality protein and easily available energy. And this diet which you are going to feed the dog, it, it's better if you're going to introduce this uh, diet at the beginning of the breeding itself. Okay. See, at the time of 30 days, at, at 30 days where I actually need an increased diet or an improved diet, at that time, there could be a possibility of a drop in appetite in some of the dogs. Okay. So it's easier, or, and so they may not be 
you know, uh, they may not take the new diet which you're trying to introduce. So it's easier to introduce it at the time of breathing itself. Or if there is going to be any digestive disturbance associated with it, with a newly di uh, introduced diet, it can happen even before the dog becomes pregnant. So start this uh, at the beginning of the heat period also. Now after first 30 days, normal maintenance diet, thereafter start increasing the diet so that by 45 days, the dog is having one and a half times its maintenance diet. Now during the last three weeks of gestation, now the uterus is going to almost occupy the entire abdomen. So the dog may not be able to eat that much. So small, multiple meals in small quantities is, is very important during the later stages of gestation. Now this growth of lactation diet should be continued until weaning and a 2 to 3% of extra food needs to be fed when the puppy is around 2 to 4 weeks of age. This is the time of peak lactation period. Okay, so now how, I mean administration of drugs during pregnancies. So are they associated with this? Now definitely there are associated with this because as a veterinarian it's very important I would always say that it's important that you avoid any antibiotics or drugs during pregnancy because drugs which are administered less than 20 days of gestation, there's a possibility which are they are embryo toxic or they may cause abortions. Drugs administered during mid gestation may cause internal or external visible malformations of the fetus. And when they're administered beyond 45 days, they may cause problems in the central nervous system or cardiovascular system of the developing fetus. So it's very important that you don't give drugs there are certain drugs that are safe during pregnancy and it's important that you need a uh, seek or veterinary help for for choosing the right type of antibiotic or drugs if there is an issue with your dog okay now you know that your dog is pregnant fine you've done a pregnancy diagnosis you're taking care of a nutrition now around 45 days you need to isolate this dog okay now when i say isolation i don't mean putting her in one case another dog in another cage okay when I say isolation, <clears throat> this dog should be totally away from all other dogs. I, under any ideal kennel situation, a breeding or a, or a pregnant dog is, or, or a kennel which is holding a pregnant dog is totally away from all other dogs. Now, this is, this is important during the last three weeks of gestation and the first three weeks of the parturition. Okay. This is to prevent canine herpes virus infection. So what exactly happens in a canine virus, a herpes virus infection? This can be transmitted to puppies either in the birth canal when the mother is infected or when the puppies come into contact with infected oral and nasal secretions from the mother or other infected dogs. Okay. Now, the, these puppies will start crying. There will be weakness, depression, nasal bleeding would be there, discharge from the nose, soft yellow feces, loss of suckling reflex would be there. And as a result, what happens is you find that one after the other, these, these puppies are starting to die. Okay. Now, a low temperature. We always... I've had a lot of time people telling me, ma'am, I keep my dog and puppies in the AC and all that. Okay, you need to understand when a puppy is born, it cannot regulate its body temperature. So already its body temperature is lower than the normal. So when I'm going to put it in an air conditioning, then it's going to further lower the temperature and low body temperatures may cause a rapid spread of this multiplication of virus, which is going to rapidly kill your puppies. So most importantly, you need to take care of this issue also. Okay. So next we're going to address deworming and vaccination. Okay. So do I deworm my pregnant dog? Okay. Yes. Now this is very important because I have a lot of times, you know, people have the misconception that if I'm going to deworm my pregnant dog, she's going to abort. Okay. Now the strategy is that you need to deworm your dog before breeding and at 45 days of gestation, you need to compulsively deworm your dog. Okay. Now deworming will not cause abortion or will not cause resorption okay it's perfectly safe for pregnancy all deworming drugs except albendazole albendazole is contraindicated all other deworming drugs are perfectly safe during pregnancy please if there is an abortion that happens there are so many reasons for abortions or resorptions please do not attribute it to deworming in fact you can deworm start there is there are schedules where you can deworm a dog at starting from 45 days a continuous deworming, daily deworming, even up to first 14 days after whelping. So for 37 days, you're continuously deworming your dog. So this is also a schedule that's there. It's perfectly safe. These are documented schedules. So you have to deworm to prevent the transplacental transfer of Toxicara canis. Okay. Now, <coughs> vaccination. Do I be deworm up? I mean, do I vaccinate my pregnant dog? No. Normally, even if the bitch is due for vaccines, we don't deworm a pregnant dog. So any, any vaccination, it should be done before the dog is being 
bread, bread or before mating itself. Okay. And uh, so during the late gestation, I'm, I need to introduce a dog or into a whelping box, which is easy to clean with a pig rail. And this pig rail design will help to prevent neonatal crushing. This is ideal. This is ideal. And it's important because the last three weeks, last few weeks is when the dog gets used to this whelping environment so that she could deliver normally. Okay. An occasional mucoid discharge, mucoid discharge during pregnancy is perfectly normal. A pink color discharge is also perfectly normal. Uh, a kind of an abnormal discharge, a greenish black discharge, bloody discharge during pregnancy. If you see this at any time, now this requires a veterinary in uh, intervention. A purulent discharge also at this time is also very, very important because you need to rule out what is called as pyometra in the case of dogs. Okay. Your dog may not be pregnant, but she may also be going into a condition called as pyometra, which is also so whenever you have a discharge, right? It's important that you get uh, you monitor the well-being of your dog either. And most important is your ultrasound. OK, do it. So now that your dog is now going for 40, 50, 50, 55 days. So I would now recommend a radiographic examination. OK, so all this time I've been telling you go for an ultrasound examination to monitor the fetal well-being. Now at 52 to 55 days, I would prefer to go for a radiographic examination because this would tell me the number of fetuses. OK, now this is also please remember. Yes, it's fine if I have three fetuses, four fetuses, five fetuses. But this image which I'm showing you have too many fetuses. So there could be an overlapping of fetuses where even a radiography cannot accurately predict the number of puppies that are going to be present. OK, so that means Though I would say, yes, there are pups that are present. I would also recommend you to go for a post well radiography. Now, that's very, very important for me. OK, now this is this is to it is it is to rule out any retained fetuses. Now, I could give you a classical case. Now, this was a case where this dog was bought after whelping. OK, we do an ultrasound imaging. I don't see any retained fetuses at all. So. If I'm going to do just an ultrasound imaging, I assume that there's nothing there. And I would simply say this dog is fine. All the puppies are delivered and you can go back home and no issues. But when you take a radiographic image of the same dog, you are able to see a retained the dead and emphysematous fetus, which is highly detrimental to the life of your dog. OK, now please understand that retained fetuses could cause death of your dam. And so it's very important that I go for a post well radiographic examination to rule out the presence of these retained fetuses. OK, so finally, I think probably I'm coming to the last part of my presentation, which is on dystopia. So I know a lot of times I've had, uh, you know, um, pet owners bringing their dogs to me, saying this dog delivered at uh, maybe at uh, six o'clock in the morning. And then he's been waiting for subsequent puppies to be delivered. And he's waiting till 6 o'clock in the evening or 7 o'clock in the evening. And then he comes back to me saying, yes, ma'am, I just want to check whether there's any retained fetuses. OK. So the question is, how long do I wait before seeking intervention? OK. Now, this is a very, very uh, you know, it's important uh, uh, thing to understand. Because there are certain rules as far as uh, parturition is concerned. So when I have a greenish black discharge, now that's a normal sign of parturition and it indicates that the cervix is completely relaxed and the, the delivery is going to happen shortly. OK, so when I have a greenish black discharge, the puppy should be starting to deliver within within around two, and two to two and a half hours. Now, if the dog is continuously straining and if there is no expulsion of a puppy, then that requires veterinary intervention. Now, let's say this dog is continuously delivering one puppy, two puppies born, three puppies are born. Thereafter, she's not. She's not pushing. She's continuously straining. She's not pushing. Then you require a veterinary intervention. OK, now you need to understand the interval between two pups should not be more than two to two and a half hours. Now, if that is going to exceed two and a half hours, I have had three puppies born. Now, after that, there is no puppy that is born. Then that also requires a veterinary intervention. OK, now usually what they say is it takes 24 hours for parturition to be completed. Yes, it is right. But what happens what, when, when do I say that is when let's say I have a dog which is having around 10 or 12 puppies and each puppy is born at an interval of maybe it's say two to two and a half hours. See, it can be born at 10 minutes or 15 minutes, but max if it's born at every puppy is born at 
the maximum two to two and a half hours interval, then it will take 24 hours for all the 10 or 12 puppies to be born. That's normal. Okay. But it is not normal for a dog to have a puppy born at two and a half hours and thereafter no expulsion of the fetus at all. So this requires veterinary intervention. Please approach your veterinarian for this. Okay. And my last slide on this presentation or my technical presentation would be you're seeing on, on the top, you have a uterine torsion. Okay. So this is actually a condition wherein you can see on the right side, you have, I'm sorry, on the right side, you have, this is a fetus and the portion just anterior to the fetus has undergone torsion. Okay. So that means this dog is continuously straining and she's unable to deliver the fetus because of uterine torsion. Now, this is also a, a warranting. This is also a very serious condition that warrants uh, immediate attention, veterinary intervention. And this is where I wanted to talk to you about. Now, the bottom you're seeing what is called as uterine rupture where you see a rupture of the uterine wall here. And this is a seepage of this uterine contents into the abdominal cavity, okay, which has, which we have drained it out. Okay. Now, this dog was actually administered oxytocin, okay, indiscriminate administration of oxytocin by the breeder themselves. Okay. So, one of the rules, now the rules in oxytocin administration are that it cannot be administered when the cervix is closed. Also, it cannot be administered when there's going to be an obstructive type of dystopia. What do I mean by obstructive? The already there is an impacted fetus, the fetus is there, and the dog is already constantly taining. There's an abnormal flexion of the fetus. Maybe the pelvis is narrow, the fetus is big, and there is an so there's an obstructive, it's an obstructive type of dystopia. Okay. And under this situation, when I'm going to continuously administer oxytocin, it's going to cause a rupture of the uterus. So once again, Please do not indiscriminately use oxytocin for a, as a as a resort for okay treatment of dystopias. Okay, so finally I conclude with three important kind of you know home uh, kind of you know funny questions that people tend to put to me uh, in my practice. Can a commercially available human pregnancy diagnosis kits be used to diagnose pregnancy in dogs? No, I cannot use this human pregnancy kits to diagnose pregnancy in dogs because the human kits are based on identification of human chorionic gonadotropin or HCG, which is only produced by the human placenta and the primate placenta. It is not produced by dogs at all. Instead, in the case of canines, relaxin is a hormone which is very specific for canine pregnancy. And if you use the relaxin kits, maybe you can assay or you can diagnose pregnancy. Can progesterone be given to maintain pregnancy in a dog? A lot of times people do this because they, do, they have an indiscriminate practice of breeding their dog and immediately starting with progesterone to avoid abortions or resurrections. No, progesterones are not to be given during pregnancy in the case of canines. Now you need to understand the amount of progesterone to maintain pregnancy is just two nanograms. But in the case of dogs, I have nearly 50 to 80 nanograms of progesterone that is present. Hence an abortion due to luteal insufficiency or I can call the condition as hypoluteoidism is extremely rare in dogs. Now also, progesterone administration during a pregnant or in a pregnant dog may cause cryptorchid male puppies or masculinized female pups. So never administer progesterone for a pregnant dog. Now, if the dog is not pregnant and if you administer progesterone, there is always a possibility of development of pyometra or cystic endometrial hyperplasia. So there's always a no to progesterone administration for dogs okay in canine reproduction so rarely we rarely use progesterone administration in canine uh, reproductive practice and uh, last question does breedings on different dates result in the birth of puppies of different gestational ages or sizes okay now this is very very you know you know kind of funny funny because when i say i need you need to breed your dog you need to mate her on multiple dates so you need to understand even though ovulations or fertilizations happen on different dates. Okay. Now you will think that the puppies are going to be born of different sizes, right? But it doesn't happen. Even though this is going to ovulations or fertilization happening on different dates, the development of the puppies are synchronized in that all the puppies are of the same developmental stage when they are born. So definitely do not worry when there is a variation in size of the puppy, it is mainly relate, related to what is called as genetics of that particular puppy, the amount of blood supply that is going to the pup, that particular puppy, the placental development of that particular puppy. Okay, so variations in size are related to this genetics, and it is not related to different mating dates. So thank you so much for this presentation.
and uh, yes be responsible and stay safe during this covid period thank you once again ishwar um th thank you Oh, thank you, Dr. Sudevi. Um, that was actually an exhaustive uh, content uh, that you provided. Uh, I, I know Canon reproduction. Uh, you know, you know this. This I would say is is going to be an important tool because this is a permanent record, like I stated before, and uh, this record is going to be available online on YouTube. And I will make sure that I share the link. So if you had a question and it covers. You know, if it has any questions about, uh, you know, from planning a mating to the basics of reproduction or to managing the Easter cycle or caring for the pregnant bitch, you covered all of them. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, thank you. Oh, thank you. And we, we did actually, I, I did have a list of about 40 to 45 questions, but, you know, after your presentation, I'm actually down to, a, you know, you've striked out a lot of things. Have you addressed a lot of those questions? So, but we, I do have a few questions um, for the benefit of the audience. And uh, Jessima and I are going to take turns asking you those questions. Uh, okay. Jay? So, so we'll we get started with the first question, Doctor. So, uh, is silent heat the same as missing a heat? What treatment can regularize such cycles? Okay, now uh, this term of uh, silent heat or a missed heat, you know, it's kind of uh, this terminology is kind of an overlapping between them, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually what happens in a silent, or, or in, in other words, when a dog comes into heat, you know there's going to be vaginal discharge, there's going to be edema of the vulva, and this bitch is going to be sexually receptive or attracting the male dogs, okay? Now, in silent estrus, there would be an absence of this vaginal discharge, and maybe, probably, some dogs would have a vulval edema would be there, she would be still attracting a male dogs. Some may neither have the discharge nor vulval edema, but still be attracting male dogs. So this, this kind of the physical manifestation of these heat changes will not be present in a silent heat, okay? And this incidence of silent heat is very common as a dog enters into a puberty. That means the first heat, okay? Or it's more common as the dog becomes older. So you okay. the, usually I say don't breed a dog during the first heat. This is not because she's not of the right size or she's not of the right age. This is because the incidence of abnormal cycles, silent heat, split heat, or short cycles. They're very common with the onset of puberty. And that's why we say don't breed the dog during the first heat. Wait for the cycle to set into a pattern and start breeding her during the subsequent cycles. Okay. So now, how do I address a silent heat? Okay. So having a male is the most important way to identify a silent heat. There's absolutely no way. There's no treatment for this. So identifying using your male, or if you have a male, that's the best option. Now, if you don't have a male, in the absence of a male, a very close observation of your female for any kind of discharge because these most of these dogs have very scanty discharge and the constant licking will actually make you not able to identify it okay and some amount of and maybe the attraction of a male these are symptoms or reasons why you may identify okay and a, a, a regular a regular or frequent or regular intervals of uh, vaginal exfoliative cytology will help you to identify this silent heat in my practice, I've identified so many cases of silent heat, bred them, timed the ovulation, bred them based on ovulation timing, and they become pregnant, okay? So basically, there is no treatment that can regularize. It's just a biological variation of a normal heat, okay? So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, just adding on to that, uh, doctor. So does it mean that there are, there might be some lines where the silent heats can happen? I, I am assuming in a, in a specific breed. No. Basically, there is no pre breed, uh, predisposition to it, okay? okay. There's absolutely, okay. So those are kind of misconceptions, but there is no basic predisposition to it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know because sometimes uh, here to answer yours, I have a lot of times people coming to me saying, my dog is not coming to heat. Uh, it's almost seven months, it's almost eight months, but you need to understand that the cycle or interval between two heat periods can range anywhere between five, five months to even 11 months. So this is considered as perfectly normal. So most of the time people come to you saying that I miss a heat because it's just eight months over, nine months over. So this is a perfectly normal cycle. That's why I said. So there is no basic predisposition, great predisposition to it. At all. Okay. okay. Even in a specific breed, assuming that we're talking about boxes here. So even okay. in boxes, if there are specific lines, we're talking about pedigrees as such, can, we, can okay. there be a bitch pedigree which is having this kind of an... Uh, no, actually, silent east, they are congenital. They are not hereditary. Okay. 
so okay, okay. dog may have a silent heat then subsequently she may go for normal cycles normal okay, ones, okay. or okay. this is very common as she becomes older or she may have continuously silent heat cycles so this is nothing which is related to any genetics or heritage fair point fair point all right yeah okay i yeah. think that will address most of the query that uh, people would have had it okay Thank sure? you. You you striked out about five five questions on that list, Doctor, with that answer. Uh, so uh, so I actually have heard about this term. Uh, you know, you covered this in in some uh, in some detail. Um, what is called? What you know? Can you simplify for our viewers? Uh, what you what is called as hypothyroidism in dogs? Okay. Uh, I'm sure all of you know that uh, you have a thyroid gland. That's uh, it's a butterfly-shaped gland, which is located at the base of the throat, right? Okay, and this thyroid gland produces a hormone called as thyroxin. And uh, this thyroxin. So normally, when you talk about hormones, you know they have specific target organs. Now, unfortunately, this thyroid organs, all uh, thyroid hormone has target organs in almost all the tissues in the body. Okay, so that means. it controls a varied amount of metabolic activities that are associated with breathing respiration or cardiac associations cholesterol so this thyroid gland or the thyroxin plays a, a, a kind of a very important role so when you when this thyroid gland fails to su produce sufficient amounts of this thyroxin hormone then you say that your dog is going in for hypothyroidism okay now when you have hypothyroidism when a dog has hypothyroidism most often there would be depression or a kind of you know immobility so the dog tends to put on more weight there would be a lot of skin uh, related disorders and when you're talking about reproduction there would be anestrus prolonged duration for the dog to come back into her feed cycle okay so abnormal cycles or extended cycles would be there and this is also associated with female or male infertility okay so now the most trickiest part in hypothyroidism is it's been most uh, a kind of like overly diagnosed right because when i say there is a deficiency of thyroid hormone that means this dog is having hypothyroidism okay now you need to keep an understand so that means if i want to diagnose the condition i check for the thyroid the thyroxin levels and if the thyroxin levels are low then i say this dog is having hypothyroidism but it is not actually true some drug administration or even systemic involvement in the dog can also lower the thyroid levels okay now certain breeds of dog for example the whippets okay and greyhounds they also have low thyroxin levels right so you need to keep all this in mind so when i'm doing a hypothyroidism when i'm evaluating a dog for hypothyroidism i need to make sure that the dog is perfectly healthy it does not have any other systemic involvements no i mean breed specifications all this needs to be kept in mind and i am not only look for looking for thyroxin levels i'm also looking for tsh level thyroid stimulating hormone level which is also responsible for secretion of the thyroxin so everything put together my diagnosis is based on i mean on this right and it's a very very easy once i diagnose it to be positive for hypothyroidism supplementing with oral thyroxin is going to set right the condition okay but there's a life life lifelong supplementation there's no way that you can you know stop treatment half it even though the dog responds to your treatment yeah oh okay my doctor okay. again is I, it I a genetic is not in his head no because, because is it a genetic condition uh, again going back to the question of whether it is genetics i will tell, tell you where i am coming from i had a i have my mentor who is into fox terriers she had a lines of hers with had thyrox uh, thyroxin i mean hypothyroidism as a problem where but she had given up those lines and then started afresh altogether okay i just want to understand whether it will be a genetic condition or it will flow on because when there is a problem with your thyroid only when it's going to be a problem with your thyroid gland right okay then mm -hmm. there is be it's going to affect the thyroxin uh, production okay. generally a thyroid gland is there which is going to be producing it's going to be a playing an important role in metabolic activity right it's going to govern so many activities in the body so whenever there is going to be a problem for example a, a hypertrophy or a degeneration of the thyroid gland or tumors of the thyroid gland that's when you have these issues that are coming up okay so okay. i i really cannot give you an explanation for a line lineage that is there because again or uh, technically speaking or scientifically speaking uh, hypothyroidism is not too much in genetics again okay. okay. so individual dog specific individual dog specific okay. yeah uh, yes sure you could continue <laughs> yeah can oh, dogs no, no, treated no, no. thyroid be bred right yes definitely i can breed these dogs okay 
because once I put them on to oral thyroxin supplementation, these dogs will start responding to it, come back to normal, cyclicity can be, and I can breed these dogs normally. Absolutely. No issues. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, just had a question for you on... Uh, the puppy absorption, uh, Dr. Sudevi. Uh, you know, you m mentioned that about the ultrasound in the day 25, you know, 20, 25 day range, just to assess how many fetuses are developing in the puppy. Uh, well, I've heard instances um, uh, where, you know, you have multiple fetuses developing, uh, puppies developing, but again, when the litter is due, you don't get the exact turnout. You know, that, you know, I would, yeah. I would call it as puppy absorption. Uh, can any preventative measures be adopted by the breeder to stop this from happening? Okay, that's an interesting question. And uh, you need to understand this is a very, very common phenomenon that's happening in dogs, okay? So wherein a partial, you're just talking about a gestation, you're talking about completion of a gestation period, okay? There's also a possibility where a partial or complete absorption can happen. So wherein by, may, let's say around, maybe 40 days or 45 days, the owner comes to the complaint that there's a vaginal discharge. And when you do an ultrasound, you find that all the fetuses are completely absorbed or resorbed, okay? There could be a situation where you breed this dog and the owner, as you said, the owner would be waiting for a whelping to happen, okay? And you find that there are no puppies at all. Now, there are two possibilities. One is maybe the dog was not pregnant at all, okay? The other possibility is she could have become pregnant, but there is the possibility is they could have she could have completely absorbed a litter, right? Okay. So the only way to confirm this condition is to go for an ultrasound examination and to monitor the fetal well-being. That's why I'm saying without doing an ultrasound examination, without confirming a pregnancy, you cannot say this dog didn't deliver, so maybe she's gone in for an absorption. No, you cannot do that, right? She should have been confirmed for a pregnancy. And then if she doesn't deliver, probably it's a case of absorption or a desorption. Okay. Now, there are several reasons. Now, it, the, you know, methods to stop this from happening, it's very difficult because the underlying positive factors, you know, you need to understand that. So this can be due to a maternal stress, systemic illness in a dog that can cause abortions or resorption, brutal luckiness, herpes virus infections, okay, carbohydrate deficiency, I told you, deficiency or nutritional imbalance malnutrition, all these are contributing factors for a fetal abortion or resorption. Now, actually, maybe a, a couple of months ago, we had a spate of abortions that were happening in our college, okay? So when we checked these dogs, all these dogs were having a low platelet count, okay? Or they were actually suffering from e canis, early shiosis or thick fever. So you need to actually address an underlying issue that can that is actually causing a fetal resorption to happen, okay? There's no way you can prevent it. Once it happens, yes, it's going to happen, right? So there is, you're not going to, so that, that again, the thumb rule is that whenever you have an abortion or a resorption taking place, always encourage the ongoing abortion. I'm not going to try to retain any fetuses, right? I'm making sure that the remaining fetuses are also expelled out. So that's your thumb rule in treatment, treating a case of abortion, okay? So that's, it. I hope it's yeah wonderful thank you yeah, jay you want to go ahead with the next question yes uh, so the next question is about uh, the conception rates on AA procedures uh, doctor so conception or success rate may vary based on the insemination technique and the skin skill of the operator which insemination technique according to you can a veterinarian master easily okay <laughs> now that the kennel club has uh you know i think uh it's yeah, authorized right. and AI. i think this is a question that's in everybody's mind, right? Okay. Very good. So when you're talking about uh, insemination technique, again, no? now the technique depends upon the site of deposition of the sperms. Okay. Whether I'm going to deposit it into the vagina or if I'm going to deposit it into the uterus. Now, oh. if I'm going to deposit it into the vagina, I call this as intravaginal inseminations. I usually do this when I'm going to use uh, fresh semen AI. So wherein I just collect the semen and deposit it into the vagina, and here, the consumption rates are going to depend on the quality of the semen and the timing of insemination. That's a very important contributing factor for the success rate. Okay. okay. Now, once I freeze the semen, so once I freeze the semen, now what happens is the post thaw viability of the frozen semen. When I say post thaw viability, it means I freeze the semen, and once I thaw it for insemination, the thaw viability is now reduced only to 24 hours. 
as against 4 to 11 days in the normal reproductive tract. Okay. okay? So now it's going to be 24 hours. So that means once I freeze the semen, this semen has to be deposited only into the uterus for which intrauterine deposition and timing of ovulation becomes a mandate for frozen semen AI. Okay. okay. So okay. as far as the technique is concerned, I know intravaginal inseminations are very easy. It can be easily performed by most veterinarians. But if I want to go for intrauterine insemination, either it's surgical or it is going to be by transcervical insemination. Okay. Now, transcervical inseminations, advantages, I can do repeated inseminations any number of times, right? But the disadvantage is that you need to master the technique and you need an equipment that is required, right? So, which is pretty expensive. So, every veterinarian cannot invest around 10 to 12 lakhs just for a frozen semen, you know, transcervical insemination. Okay. But uh, if you want to go for surgical insemination, yes, it is possible, yes. And uh, this can also be done with adequate training of the veterinarian on ovulation timing. So, okay, so every every vet can do a surgical insemination. But the most important thing is he should be also trained to go for a semen analysis, for a post evaluation of the semen, and for intrauterine deposition, and for ovulation timing. So with this, I think, you know, it's possible to train our vets, okay? And with frozen semen, I think in a, you, you, we're not far away from all this. But uh, I think there is a lot of discussion even earlier with you about this uh, on the AI prospects as such. I think we have not had much of success in the earlier interventions and trials. Yeah. On it. yeah, 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 that's right. That's right. That's right. Because uh, we've been doing a lot of frozen semen AI, right? Okay. But we've been doing only transcervical inseminations. So okay. still people here are not, you know, they're not willing to go in for surgical insemination because we are not using a very high quality of semen that they they want a conception to happen from it okay so all this has been done on research basis we've been collecting dogs from you know we've been collecting semen from our local uh, you know breeders dogs and owners freezing them and trying to do inseminations so most of our research is based on transcervical inseminations but i think frozen semen ai using surgical definitely i don't think there should be a problem with our knowledge on ovulation timing and you know uh, the skill of surgery, I don't think there should be an issue at all. Okay. I think yeah. that clarifies another aspect which uh, was quite impending in our minds. Wonderful. We'll go to the next one. Yeah, uh, Ishwar, your turn. Yeah. Uh, look, looking forward to that, uh, Dr. Sridevi. I think, uh, you know, with the artificial insemination uh, being approved uh, as a practice with canine reproduction by the Parent Body Care Club of India, uh, I, think, I think there is a lot of interest and appetite amongst people uh, to uh, you know get information about ai how they can do it and i think i'm sure and confident with your expertise uh, you know I'm, I'm sure you know veterinarians can be trained and this can actually easily be adopted in india i'm sure and i hope and pray this happens uh, soon so that you know we get we reap the benefits of this artificial insemination uh, my, my next question to you dr sridevi is actually about uh, uh, it's, it's actually about uh, the collection of semen, uh, you know, in terms of collecting semen from a stud dog, uh, what would be the ideal age to collect a dog and store the semen? Okay, that's a great question. And uh, yeah, so, you know, ironically, I've had a lot of people asking me for, for you know, freezing the dog semen, but they come to me at a time when the dog is almost seven years of age, they finish showing this dog, and they've made champions of this dog, and then now they want to freeze the dog semen, okay? So now you need to clearly understand that freezing should be done at the prime age of the dog, okay? So most importantly, probably by around two years of age, I could start collecting, freezing. I mean, I can start, the, so as long as I'm able to get a good quality semen, I mean, even at six months of age, it's fine. I can start collecting and freezing the dog semen, okay? Provided the semen is able to meet my criteria of freezing, okay? All dog semen do not freeze. First, you need to understand. And for a semen to, uh, for, for me to freeze a dog semen, it should have certain criteria. It should have 70% of progressively motile sperms. It should have more than, you know, so much of live and dead spermatozoa that's there. The abnormality percentage should meet, um, you know, a critical level. It should not go beyond that. Now, that's all very important because if I have a motility percentage of 70 before freezing, 
Once I freeze, the seminate comes down to 50% or less. Okay, so that's where you need to clearly understand that the quality of the semen is important for freezing. I mean, for you know, collecting and freezing the dog semen. So ideally, I could start at any age from two mates, two years of age, and most important is freeze your dog semen when it is of the prime age, not when it's older. Okay, yeah. Got it. Perfect. Uh, that answers my question. Two, actually, I had two other questions, but you actually answered three questions in one. I was going to ask you about sperm mortality and uh, the mort you know, motile sperm count for artificial insemination, but but thank you, you answered that question. Uh, Jay, on yeah. to your... I, I also would like to talk about the motile sperm count you required, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So ideally for an insemination dose, it's around 200 million sperms. Uh, now this is, again, because people who are interested in AI, they would like to know this, right? So when I want an insemination to be performed, I would require an ideal insemination dose anywhere between 150 to 200 million sperms. It's not 200 sperms, it's 200 million sperms would be the ideal dose, an insemination dose. Okay? Yeah. Now, now let's, let's go wow. on to the second. Adding on to the same question, doctor. Uh, yes, can you Jay, also brief us about uh, extenders in the sperm uh, freezing aspect? One. Second is on how crucial is the cold chain uh, of. Uh, a frozen uh, semen transport, transport, transportation and transfusion. That's, very important. That's why I said, ideally, when you do everything, you have a quality that comes down to 50%. Okay, you have a motility that comes down to 50%. If your freezing protocol is not good, your extenders are not good, you have contaminations, now everything is going to affect your post thaw motility as well as your viability. Okay, it's just not the motility. So I may end up having a good, very good sample, which was initially very good. But once mm -hmm. I freeze it and then I thaw it, maybe I'll have a 0% motility, okay? So ideally, right from collecting to freezing to storage of salmon, there are very, very important steps that require a lot of care and precautions to be taken. Yeah. So that's important. Uh, again, from your experience with the Tanuvas, uh, has there been instances of importing semen of other uh, species? I'm talking about bovine or uh, horse species. How successful were they on that? Yeah, so we have the, actually Tanuvas has not been involved, but uh, mm -hmm. we have been involved since I've, I've also been working on this multiple ovulation embryo transfer techniques, right? So okay. we have projects, couple of projects and government projects where we had actually imported frozen salmon and frozen embryos from abroad. Okay. Okay? So okay. uh, right now there's a lot of issues with regard to import of semen, regard to import of embryos also, but this mm -hmm. can be done. Uh, but it requires a lot of uh, procedures or, uh, you know, uh, that you need to actually thrash it out before this is possible as far as import of canine semen is done. Okay? okay. So this is, this has happened. This has happened in the past. Yeah. Fair point. I think that addresses a lot of other myths that we are all being uh, dodged around with per se. So we'll go yeah. to the next uh, question, doctor. So uh, what is toxic um, myths? In yeah. The yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I go into it. Okay. No, so no, what no. Are the sorry, that's your question. Go for it. Yeah, that's your question. yeah. How do you differentiate puppies with indigestion problems versus those affected with the toxic milk syndrome? Okay. Now, this definition of toxic milk syndrome, you know, <coughs> you know what? You get an ideal definition of it, right? Okay. So, this has not been well established at all. Now, we presume that puppies uh, of three to six, uh, you know, three to 16 days old puppies, when they drink the mother of a milk, that contains toxins, okay? Mm -hmm. And this mother probably is suffering from an uterine infection or a mammary gland infection, and she starts to produce toxins in the milk. And these puppies, when they drink the milk, they are prone to mortality or you know or morbidity, okay? And so such puppies will start crying, will start you know constantly crying, and then they would be bloating, they would have diarrhea. Some of the puppies will have kind of you know a, a, a yellow, straw yellow colored feces with a kind of, uh, you know, a sore uh, smell to it, right? And the most important thing is you would find a purplish cauliflower anus in these puppies. Now, this is a clear feature of puppies which are, uh, are undergoing what is called as uh, the toxic milk syndrome, right? Okay. Effects of toxic okay. milk syndrome. Now, okay. basically, it affects the entire litter. So the entire litter is usually simultaneously affected. It's not just related to one particular puppy or another puppy. It's usually the entire litter is affected. And weaning the puppies away from the mother and starting them with artificial milk is going to be the next step, right? Okay. Now with indigestion, it is related to the individual pup. It may be either an infectious cause. It may be due to overfeeding, 
over intake of milk or probably some uh, worm infestation protozoal infestation that is going to cause an indigestion problem okay, okay. so generally uh, toxic milk affects the entire litter whereas indigestion affects you know individual pups it may not be related to the entire puppy as a whole yeah fair point i think that wonderful uh, gives thank clarity. you so much dr sridevi yes sir sure. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a question from a viewer, Dr. Sri Devi. Uh, Kamal actually asked this question. Uh, Kamal has a boxer bitch. Uh, he's not sure whether that bitch has any hormone issues. Uh, it has not come into season. Uh, she's over two years now. Uh, do you have any spec? Do you recommend any specific treatments, or what type of treatment would you recommend for Kamal to uh, to actually uh, use on his bitch? So at present, I really don't. I really don't think that there's, there's any problem at as of now. Okay, because when you say you know most people, you know, they expect the dogs to come into it at six months of age. It's not really that, right? So I can have two dogs with me, and one may come into it at six months of age. Another dog may have at least one and a half to two years for her to come into it. Okay, so normally this issue is not addressed up to three years of age. Okay. So I don't bother. I don't. I don't really consider this as an issue after three years of age. Now, even after three years of age, if she does not come into heat, then maybe I need to consider this. Okay. So maybe I need to look for silent heat. Maybe I need to look for a primary anestrum where, though rare, she may not be having ovaries at all. Okay. So that's that's extremely rare, right? It's called as a primary anestrum, right? So where she may not be coming into heat at all. So. Uh, or this maybe there could be some issues over related to her, you know, chromosomal aberrations that may be causing all this, right? So these may be looked after if she's not coming into heat beyond three years of age. So I would say at this point, just benign neglect, wait for some time. Let's wait for another six months and let's let's kind of address this issue at a later point of time. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, Dr. Sinevi, I actually have just a supplement question to that one. Um, and again, this was one of the questions that came up during an interview uh, with, with a breeder. Um, she mentioned that if you're going to be using multiple sires on a, a, on a breeding, um, let's say, and one of them happens to be a frozen salmon breeding and the other one happens to be a live breeding, uh, the chances okay. of, um, one of the breedings, one of the breeding is a frozen salmon breeding and the other mm -hmm. one is, uh, let's say, it's a live breeding. Um, okay. The live semen will actually be the ones that will win the battle. The frozen semen will lose the battle to the live semen. How far mm -hmm. is you know is, is that is there a medical uh, you know medical I, proof to that? There's no medical background to it. Okay, uh, uh, you know I'll see. What I, I I'm going to freeze a semen, and see so you need to understand when you deposit sperms. Okay, let's say any species for that matter. You have millions of sperms that are deposited, right? Ultimately, it's only one that's going to go and fertilize, right? And so it's kind of just let the best man win or the less let, let let the best sperm win. You know, it's it's you never you never know. And we also say that those which are very you know they travel very fast and they're the they are the first ones to reach the oviduct. They are not the ones that are actually going to fertilize. Okay, so that you need to clearly understand that just because these these sperms are more motile than the frozen salmon sperm they are not the ones that are going to fertilize okay so that does the, that again doesn't uh, you know matter at all so okay. i don't think okay. there's any kind of you know uh, truth to that kind of uh, correlation there yeah Got it. okay one well, that answers my question thank you uh jake you want to go yeah. take the next one we'll take it so can the fading puppy syndrome be avoided by taking preventive steps during the gestation period okay Okay, so this means, uh, you know, there are two things you need to understand here. There's something called the true fading puppy syndrome, right? Okay, so where uh, puppies are normal, they're born normally, they have a normal birth weight, uh, the mothers are fine, and uh, there is absolutely no issues as far as the puppy is concerned, but still the puppies start dying one after the other within three to five weeks after birth, okay? Now, this is called as a true fading puppy syndrome, right? Okay. Where everything is normal, still the puppy is dying. The cause is perfectly unknown, right? And 55% of these pups undergo what is called as a true fading syndrome without an unknown cause. Now, the remaining 45%, they undergo the next thing, which is called as a fading puppy syndrome, 
wherein there is some causative factor that is responsible for death of these puppies okay so let me talk about these factors and so let's say maybe it's a hypothyroid i'm sorry it, it could be a kind of uh, what do you call it hypoglycemia okay mm -hmm. or hypothermia low temperature body temperature glucose low glucose within the puppy so if, if the puppies are not being fed properly or inadequate milk from the mother that could also result in death of the puppies right or maybe if the mother is kind of you know a too aggressive and she's not encouraging or she's not allowing the puppies to feed that could also result in death of the puppies right and there could be infectious causes any of these infectious causes and uh, worm load toxicara canis new new spora canis so many of these factors they're all associated with fading puppy syndrome wherein the puppies are going to undergo what is called the progressive death okay they would start going for hypoxia then they would go for dehydration then the body temperature goes down and slowly start to sink okay now this is that's why i said you cannot take any preventive steps to prevent a fading puppy syndrome but all you need to do is manage her during pregnancy take care of the nutrition good nutrition because again as i told you nutritional carbohydrate deficiency may cause death of neonatal mortality at at 3 to 5 days of after birth okay so good mm -hmm. nutrition management prevent herpes virus infection and try to take care of these puppies after they're born that would help in preventing this condition okay so nutrition and management it's very important okay and again management and uh, so infection of these puppies are the root of infection is going to be uh, through the umbilical cord okay so proper mm -hmm. management during whelping is also very important because there is always a possibility for these puppies to become what is infection and so to go for what is called as neonatal septicemia right that's also a contributing factor for fading puppy syndrome reasons for fading are so many so many so sometimes when a, when somebody comes to you and asks you this question ma'am can you tell me why all these puppies are dead it's tough to answer this you know right so unless these issues or management of a pregnancy is done at a right at properly you cannot address this issues after it has happened yeah okay yeah okay that's uh, that's necropsy or a postmortem of these puppies would be able to validate uh, the details on what happened yeah that's very important okay see when when you have a uh, the true fading puppies you know when you do a necropsy you won't you won't find anything except that maybe the the what do you call it the digestive tract will be empty okay, okay. other than that you don't find any findings okay mm -hmm. when it comes to this fading puppy syndrome due to a specific cause either it's a herpes virus or due to some worm load or things like this that can be diagnosed based on your necropsy that's a good okay. question yeah fair point and uh, on the kenen herpes virus aspect again doctor so they are talking about uh, we i had a letter which i lost and i was able to do i did some little bit of reading on it they say that once a bitch is infected there is a timeline in which the infection can happen if it is in the pre uh, gestation period then we lose the whole uh, i mean then we get to save at least 45 percentage of the litter and we only get to lose one segment of it and if it is towards the last uh, trimester of or last stages of the uh, delivery they say that the whole litter would be swept out no see that's Let why me. i said no herpes virus infection can start happening by only 45 days so that's why i said after 45 days is the time when you need to and the first three weeks after whelping is the time when you, okay. need to, yeah, you need to take care of it right okay and again no sometimes uh, it's it's a tough call to take you know so most of the often whatever supportive measures you are trying to do or treatment may not really be successful there's a possibility mm. that you may be able to save one or two but you it is not possible for us to save the entire litter right and most often whatever treatment you are doing by the time you start it it's too late for you to okay. do it and it's kind of you know it's tough to identify a cause and you would be doing a kind of an a kind of a supportive or an uh, a kind of you know not a, a specific therapy you try to address too many issues at the same time so that there is a possibility for puppy survival okay there may be a possibility for puppy survival to happen yeah fair point doctor i think that would have addressed a lot many uh, minds have this kind of doubts yeah you should next one sorry uh, jay go ahead okay what process causes clip pellets in puppies is it genetic or nutrition and okay. adding on they again talk about uh, supplementing folic acid from the time the witch comes into season so how okay. valid is that as a advice yeah so when you talk about cleft palate you know mostly it's 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 a genetic the cause is genetic okay mostly it's it's associated with genetic cause but mm -hmm. also environmental factors are also associated with the development of a cleft palate 
So when I'm talking about envi environmental factors, I'm talking about an exposure of a pregnant witch to toxins during pregnancy. Okay, administration of certain drugs. Toxins means I'm talking about drugs that are teratogenic. Teratogenic means abnormalities during the embryonic development. Okay, drugs that may or you know substances that may cause abnormalities due to embryo development. So, so those are they call as teratogenic. Okay, so exposure of witches during pregnancy to this, these teratogenic agents or due to probably an excess what do you call it vitamin a supplementation vitamin d supplementation or probably due to administration of drugs such as grisofulvin metronidazole aspirin so all these are going to cause cleft palate okay so that means though it's mostly genetics environmental factors or a combination of both are going to play a role in development of the cleft palate okay now folic acid uh, deficiency of folic acid has also been attributed to cause for development of the cleft palate and there has been predispositions okay breed pred pred predilections for development so mostly we see them you know most often i think you know maybe uh, beagles or schnauzers or german shepherds brachycephalic breeds of dogs you have all these are you know you i see them in cocker spaniels and they are all they have been documented reports of cleft palate in all these breeds of dogs okay mm -hmm. And folic acid, yes, there's been a lot of research wherein supplementation of folic acid has reduced the incidence of cleft palate. Okay, but please remember, this is I told you there are so many reasons for development of a cleft palate. Okay, if there is due to some other drug administration, your folic acid is not going to, you know, help. or right. you know, supplementation is not going to help. Yeah. Okay. If there is going to be a folic acid supplementation, yes, that could help. And uh, the there has been a lot of extensive research so that. Uh, Folic acid supplementation has markedly reduced the incidence by nearly 50% to 70% of cleft okay. palate. Yeah, that's the research findings. Yeah. Fair point. Thank you, Doctor. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, Doctor Sidhavi, I actually I can I can tell that you're used to doing a long uh, long lectures because you know I've not had you you know you've actually been talking continuously for the last hour and a half with just one sip of water uh, in between. Okay. Um, but thank you so much for actually uh, giving us this opportunity. Uh, uh, but I actually want to actually end this interview with one last question. Um, actually, uh, a penultimate qu question. Uh, Boxer, as you have said, is a brachy brach brachycephalic breed. Uh, also has a lot of issues in you know in kind of the size of the head in the puppy causes you know pregnancy issues yeah. in terms of whelping. Uh, now I'm sure you would have heard this question many times. Uh, about you know can we do the c-section you know because you know i'm the, the the breeder is more anxious than the puppy and is worried why the puppy why the bitch is not delivered uh so how many times is it safe to do a c-section in a bitch and specifically in a breed like a boxer okay now there are two factors to this uh, question one is why did your vet first do the cesarean section okay mm -hmm. you need to answer that because there is a reason why did the vet perform a c-section at the first place okay. okay was it probably due to some maternal factor maybe there's a narrow pelvis maybe there is a congenital uh, defect for example let's say a stricture vaginal stricture or probably there is a kind of a, a tumor or a mass or a fibroid so there could be so many reasons why your vet has performed a c-section okay and most important causes would be there is a fetal pelvic disproportion, wherein the pelvis would be normal and the, the fetal size is too big for it to come out of the pelvis, okay, leading to dystopia or an obstructor. We call this an obstructor type of dystopia due to fetal pelvic disproportion, okay. So, the first reason that there could be, you know, you need to address this issue first. Why did the vet first ask you to go for a cesarean section? Now, the second possibility is that what, what did the vet advise you after the C section, okay? Maybe I would have done a C-section and at that point of time, I would have seen probably the uterus is too damaged. There could be extensive additions that are surrounding the fetus. Maybe there could be a rupture of the fetus and I would tell the owner, please do not breed your dog again. Okay. So the decision to rebreed. So first of all, number of C-sections comes because your decision to rebreed the dog depends on these two factors. Why did you do a C-section for the first time? And again, what did the do doctor advise you? Did he tell you, yes, you're not supposed to breed the dog? Or did he tell you, yes, you can breed, it's safe. But there is a possibility that she may go for a C-section subsequently. Okay. 
Now, there are situations where, you know, as you said, brachycephalic breeds of dogs, okay? So where you want to go for elective CS, right? Where mm -hmm. we fix the time of breeding, and I'm mean, sorry, we fix the time where I can go for an elective cesarean section, okay? So where I start monitoring the dog right from 58 days of gestation, I keep collecting her blood samples, check for progesterone levels. When I have a level of less than two nanograms, I know, yes, this dog is ready for a cesarean section. I'm going to go for an elective CS, okay? Now in elective CSs, yes, I can go for the number of, I can go subsequently, I can breathe the dog, I can go for subsequent CSs. There is no documented reports to say how much of C-sections are safe, okay? Mm -hmm. But please remember with every C-section, there is going to be a increased risk associated with every C-section, okay? And ideally, I think in my practice, I would say, yes, you can go for a maximum three sections, three C-sections, but it all again depends upon whether you want to rebreed the dog or not. That's again the most important criteria, okay? So I hope that answers your question. And I don't Yes, know. it does. Yeah. I, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Sure, thank, thank you. Thank you, doctor. Uh, and again, you know, I wanted to actually be, um, thank you for taking the time. You know, it, it was actually, it, it's been a really informative session. And uh, like I had stated in, the, in my introduction, I think this uh, interview is going to be, uh, it's going to be a really useful tool, you know. Uh, you know, if you don't like the, ha if you're not in the habit of reading books uh, about canine reproduction, I think your interview will serve as a very valuable guide for people to look up and reference about different topics that you covered. So I want to take uh, take a moment to thank you for that. I also wanted to take a time to thank you for for my team who've been working in the background. I have Jay with me, who's a part of the team. I also have Kadir Narayan, and I have Satish, and I have Sushant as well that are working in the background, working tirelessly to actually bring the knowledge to uh, boxer breeders and fanciers in India and also the world over. Uh, with that said, Doctor, do you have any parting thoughts um, before we end this interview? Thank you so much, Ishwar. Thank you, Jay. Jay. I mean, you've been, Perfect. and thank you to the audience for patiently listening to me. I think it's, uh, it's dinner time for most of you in India. <laughs> so thank you for, uh, you know, taking this time to be with me and uh, I'm very happy to be a part of your uh, boxer ring and uh, yes and it's a pleasure to be here today thank you so much thank, thank you, you. Wonderful. Jay, do, you do you have any do you have any parting thoughts uh, thoughts there no as you rightly said I should I think you, you, you're the one to close the interview any parting thoughts? we have pondered a lot into a lot of very various topics I was even suggesting with uh, to issue that maybe we have another additional uh, parts you talk about uh, stud dog uh, uh, specific maintenance aspects or even because if you remember we had a first incidence where we got our australian uh, import cocker as you said after campaigning five years later we came and he said why couldn't you come you guys come earlier there with a lot of mendoza sales in this book so that's uh, that's literal ignorance we didn't have that knowledge at that point in time so maybe these kind of sessions would be able to uh, elevate those kind of uh, ignorance and bring in better breeding practices in place so we look forward to multiple sessions, uh, doctor, maybe specialized to a stud dog or a, a bitch or maybe puppies and uh, post uh, par 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 uh, whelping and uh, raising a litter and all those eggs. Looking forward to it, doctor. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ishwar. Thank you, Jay. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.